Oh, I feel his presence here this evening. <laughs> I don't, I, only way I really know how to describe how I feel, I don't, I can't say that all of you feel this way, but certainly some of you feel like you're just sitting on a keg of dynamite any minute. It's just about to explode. That's really where I feel like we are. And I appreciate the presence of God moving in this sanctuary like he is. And he is, he's moving among us, and that is essential, that is a requirement, that is an absolute necessity if you and I are going to have revival, if we're going to be the church that God demands us to be, we have got to have his presence in our midst. So I'm thankful for what I feel in this service and just the, the ministry that we're experiencing through these songs, touching hearts and lives. That's what it's all about, folks. Uh, our songs are to minister, and that's what they've been doing here tonight, I feel like. And so I really appreciate that. And I want to encourage us just to let's let God have his way. Whatever he's got in store, whatever his plan is, I just want to be a part of his plan. I can't outthink him. I can't outwork him. I can't outmove him. There's just no way I can do it. So I just just as well be a part of his plan. Whatever he has, that's what I want in this meeting. I want you to go to the book of Amos, and then we're going to go to Romans, and then we may even go to 1 Thessalonians, but let's begin in the book of Amos, chapter 6, and verse 1. Amos 6 and 1, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. Verse 3. Ye that put far away the evil day and cause the seed of violence to come near, that lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches. Verse 6, the latter part. But they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. They are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. Let's look at Romans chapter 13. <clears throat> Verse 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love and foreign helmet, the hope of salvation. And I love this verse. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to preach to you tonight with the Lord's help on we are too close for comfort. 
You can be seated. We are too close for comfort. It happened while we weren't paying attention. Everything started coming unhinged. As a result, our world is no longer the world of our grandparents. Actually, our world is no longer the world of our parents. While the church wasn't paying attention, things were changing, and society around us was eroding. We slipped from what used to be called a modern world into a postmodern world without even realizing it. We drifted from a Christian era into a post-Christian era. That's why we find ourselves in a world that is less friendly to the church and more than ever disconnected from the Bible. So it's no surprise that today's citizen is more biblically ignorant than the people of virtually any time since the dark ages. Our world is not only more ignorant of the basic facts of the Bible, but most are now skeptical and convinced that there is no such thing as absolute truth. The deception is so subtle until people are being led to believe that that which is wrong is right, and that which is bad is in fact good. And tragically, most people don't even realize it until it's too late. Ours is a whole new world. And nothing has been more adversely affected by postmodernism than the church and its relationship to God's word and its relationship to God's house and its relationship to God's ideal for his church. You see, we have reached an hour where people no longer understand God's desire for his church. Not only do they no longer understand God's desire or God's ideal for his church, they're no longer interested in God's desire or his ideal for his church. We have reached a time where people want to substitute that which is temporal for that which is eternal. And the longer substitutes replace the preaching and teaching of the word of God, then the fallout will always be biblical ignorance. The longer gimmicks take the place of the moving of the Holy Ghost, the fallout will always be spiritual powerlessness. And the longer Holy Ghost conviction is sacrificed on the altar of fleshly comfort, the fallout will always be unconverted church members. My brother and sister, there has never been a time when our world is more biblically ignorant than they are right now. But there's never been a time where the church is more biblically ignorant than they are right now. There has never been an age where the church has been more spiritually powerless than the church is right now. And there has never been a time where there has been more unconverted people attending church than there is right now. You see, we've reached a time where worldly and carnal thinking is dominating the church. And as a result of it, nobody in the world is taking the church serious any longer because what they're seeing out there, they're seeing in here uh, and over time uh, over time uh, as the church uh, distances herself uh, from the word of God uh, from the Holy Ghost of God uh, from the conviction of God uh, then brother and sister the more the church does that the less influence uh, they'll have uh, on society uh, as a whole uh, we cannot afford uh, to train ourselves uh, to sit through two hours of 
singing uh, and testifying uh, and preaching uh, and never be changed uh, and never be challenged uh, and never be stirred uh, by the power of Almighty God. Uh, we cannot afford uh, to sit through two hours uh, of service uh, and then leave uh, with the same emptiness uh, and the same void uh, in our heart uh, that we walk through the doors with. Uh, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, uh, we've got to recognize uh, the hour that we're living in. Uh, we have got to stir ourselves. Uh, we have got to be awake and realize uh, we're on the threshold uh, of the coming of the Lord. Uh, it's nigh, even at the door, and we are too close uh, for comfort in this hour. Does anybody besides me ever find yourself shaking your head and saying what's going on? Have you ever just looked around and said how did we get here? Have you ever looked at church leaders in our society and said what are you thinking? What are you thinking? Have you ever looked at a congregation and in your heart said, does anybody even care? Does anybody even care? Do you even realize what is taking place right before your very eyes? Have you ever just wanted to shake somebody and say, what is it going to take to stir you? What is it going to take to awaken you. You see, brother and sister, uh, postmodernism uh, and this idea that there's no such thing as absolute truth uh, and all decisions are to be made uh, on what is just relative at the moment. Uh, it thrives in chaos uh, and never has our society been more chaotic uh, than it is uh, right now. Uh, you see, the idea of this, this postmodernism is simply this uh, it, it is uh, the culture uh, that you and I are living in uh, and the culture is what dictates the thoughts uh, and the actions uh, of most people uh, brother and sister we are living in a culture that is godless uh, I said we are living in a culture uh, that is godless uh, nobody in Washington uh, makes a decision uh, based on what does the book say uh, or what does God think uh, brother and sister every decision is made uh, on what can best pad my pocket what can best get me reelected, uh, and that bothers us uh, and it should uh, but what ought to bother us more uh, is that the fact uh, that there are decisions being made uh, in churches uh, and by churches uh, and by church leaders uh, and there's no way uh, they're considering what the word of God says. Uh, there's no way uh, they're talking uh, to God about it. Uh, I'm here to tell you uh, in this world uh, where God uh, and his son uh, and his Holy Ghost uh, and the church uh, is swiftly getting to the place uh, where there's no place for them any longer. Uh, we better wake up uh, and we better get stirred uh, because the world uh, that you and I are living in uh, is unrecognizable recognizable uh, and we're at a time uh, when it demands uh, that the church uh, be at her best uh, this is not a time for compromise uh, this is not a time for apathy this is not a time uh, for lethal complacency uh, rather there's unprecedented uh, activity going on uh, at this very moment uh, and I'm here to tell you we need to wake up and cry out for revival we need to beg God uh, to help us to be stirred in our spirit like never before. You know, I don't, I don't want to go necessarily back to this and dwell on it. But, but I do remember where I was when those terrorists flew those planes into the World Trade Center. I was in Oklahoma in my trailer. The phone rung. and My dad said, have you heard? And I said, no. And he began to explain to me 
what was going on. My sister called and said, you got to see it. It's unbelievable. But, 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 but I, I was in revival. And one of the things that the pastor was so frustrated about was that his people were not stirred. I mean, it really didn't stir them that much. I, I went to the next revival. And, and, and in fact, before I ever got there, the, the pastor called to make sure I was coming. And he said, I, 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 I won't revival, but I don't know that my people's even stirred, even after what's happened. And, you know, we, we get stirred about things for a day or two. But there's really no perpetual stirring among the church in this hour. And the reason why is we're just too comfortable. I said, we are just too comfortable. You know what's so alarming to me in 2015? You want me to tell you what it is? The lack of alarm in the church. That's what's so alarming to me. I, I want to tell you there's some of our forefathers... There's some of those men that blazed the trail. If they were in the hour that we were living in, they'd cry and spare not. If some of your parents were still alive, some of your parents that raised you in a Pentecostal holiness church, some of you that were carried to brush harbors and tent revivals, if some of your parents and grandparents were alive and were seeing what we are seeing right now, I'm telling you, there'd have been such a stirring, there'd have been such a revival, there'd have been such a move, but where is the awareness? Where is the alertness? Where is the stirring about the seriousness of the hour. Here's another question I want to float out there for you. Where's the excitement about the rapture? I said, where's the excitement about the rapture? You would think that everything uh, that's going on in the world uh, would produce an excitement uh, about the rapture. But I say, where is it? Uh, we have been lulled to sleep. Uh, I said, we have been lulled to sleep. Uh, we have been lullabied to sleep. Uh, we have been sung to sleep. Uh, and in 2015, uh, the greatest concern that the devil has uh, it's not what the church is doing. Uh, his greatest concern is God, uh, don't let the sleeping giant be awakened. Uh, I just want them to stay uh, like they are. Uh, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, uh, Amos preached in a time uh, like you and I are living in. Uh, it was a time uh, where society was plunged uh, into sin uh, and the people of God uh, had plunged into complacency. Uh, it was a time when judgment was on the horizon but it was a time that was marked by ease in Zion judgment on the horizon but ease in Zion judgment on the horizon but ease in the church terrorist in America but ease in the church homosexual marriage in America, but ease uh, in the church. Uh, society unraveling, uh, but ease uh, at the church. Uh, don't stir me, preacher. Don't wake me, preacher. Uh, I like being blinded. Uh, I like being asleep. Uh, just let me take it easy. Uh, let me eat, drink, and be merry. Uh, just leave my life alone. Uh, I'm here to tell you uh, your soul is too valuable. Uh, the hour's too late. Uh, and the need is too great uh, for us to leave you alone. Uh, my God in heaven, uh, we need to wake up. Uh, we need to be stirred. Uh, we need to be moved. Amos 1 and 1 said the words of Amos who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years, listen, before the earthquake. Here he was. Judgment was on the horizon. 
And Amos is trying to preach. And the church is at ease in Zion. Two years before the earthquake, archaeologists have found evidence of a major destructive earthquake from this time period that is cited in Israel. It was also, uh, it also affected Samaria. And then Zechariah actually mentions this earthquake in Zechariah 14 and 5, some 200 years after it had taken place, indicating just how massive and powerful it really was. I want to read that verse to you. He said, Ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee like as you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. You see, brothers and sisters, uh, he even wrote about it uh, 200 years later uh, because it was so powerful uh, until uh, it was talked about even uh, then and the reference to it by Amos suggests that he saw it as a confirmation of his prophetic ministry and the, the, the fact that God had called him and sent him a message. He said when it happens it'll be a confirmation and he spoke about it in the ninth chapter but here's the thing when Amos was prophesying the nation was experiencing a time of prosperity when he prophesied there was territorial expansion there seemed to be political peace and brother and sister in spite of all that appeared well on the outside inwardly I mean spiritually morally and socially the, the, the nation was rottening and it was decaying. Ungodliness filled the lives of the people. Hypocrisy and phony religion was popular and people's lifestyles were selfish, excessive, and characterized by pleasure-seeking spirit and immorality. The judicial system was corrupt and in response to God's direction, Amos went to Bethel the city where King Jeroboam lived as well as the religious center of that day that would have been filled with worshipers and there Amos courageously proclaimed his message of justice righteousness and judgment for sin and how that it was coming if you look at the book of Amos you'll find in chapters 1 and 2 that he gives eight oracles of judgment uh, for the nations. Uh, in chapters 3, 4, 5, and 6, uh, he gives three prophetic messages uh, for Israel and assures her that judgment is coming. Uh, and then in chapter 7, uh, 8, and 9, uh, he gives five visions uh, of how there'll be retribution uh, for sin. Uh, but here's the thing uh, I want you to understand. Uh, he spoke to a people uh, that did not want to hear what God had to say and he confronted them in chapter 2 he looked at them and said ye commanded the prophet saying prophesy not in chapter 7 he confronted them again and the Bible said then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam king of Israel saying Amos had conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel and the land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword. Israel shall surely be led away captive into their own land, out of their own land. And Messiah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go 
flee away into the land of Judah. And there he bred and prophesied there, but prophesied not again anymore at Bethel, for it's the king's chapel and it's the king's court. Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was an herdman and a gatherer of fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock and said unto me, Go and prophesy unto my people Israel. Now therefore, hear the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, prophesy not against Israel. But Amos said, Hear the word of the Lord. I tell you what the church needs to do in this hour. They need to cry out. I want to hear from the Lord. I want to know what God has to say. Prophesy not against Israel and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, thy wife shall be an harlot in the city and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword and thy land shall be divided and thou shalt die in a polluted land. And Israel shall go forth uh, in the captivity. Uh, do you realize the reverberations uh, that take place uh, whenever you and I uh, are not stirred about the word of Almighty God? When we say uh, we don't want to hear it, Pastor. We don't want to hear it, Evangelist. We don't want to hear it, Holy Ghost. We've done made up our mind. We know what we're going to do. We know how we're going to handle it. You're not going to tell us what God has to say. You go somewhere else. If you don't go somewhere else, we will. Because we know what we want to hear and we know what we don't want to hear. But I want to tell you, Mama, I want to tell you, Daddy, you go ahead and act like that. But what about your children? I said, what about your children? How are they going to fare? What's the price going to be are you going to allow pride? Are you going to allow arrogance? Are you going to allow your own desire to cause you to lose your children? I want to tell you, I've seen this firsthand. Just this very year, I've watched as parents would say oh no uh, you're not going to pastor me uh, you're not going to talk to me uh, I know more than you do uh, I don't have to hear uh, what God is saying through you uh, and I don't even know if it is God uh, and they walked away uh, but I want to tell you it cost them their children uh, and I'm not here to threaten anybody uh, but I'm here to warn you uh, you better listen uh, you better wake up uh, you better get a hold uh, of the word of God uh, and say there's nothing any more precious to me uh, than thus saith uh, the word of the Lord. Uh, you don't know better than God does. Uh, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost, Pastor. I said you don't know better than God does. Uh, he's a big God. Uh, he's an omniscient God. Uh, he's an all-knowing God. Uh, he knows the beginning uh, from the end. Uh, and somebody better say uh, it's precious. Uh, I'll take it. Uh, I'm I'm going to wake up before it's too late. Heed my word, saith the Lord. Listen 
to what I have to say to thee this night. Uh, for I'm calling you. Uh, I'm searching for you. Uh, I'm reaching out to you. Uh, I'm wooing you uh, with my word. Uh, reject not my word. Uh, for in doing so, uh, you will be rejected. Uh, but turn to me, saith the Lord, uh, with all of your heart. Uh, and I will be found of you, uh, saith the Lord. We're on the threshold of the rapture. And your only hope is to hear the word of the Lord now. There's judgment coming. I'm not putting it off two years. We're reading it after the fact. But he prophesied for two years and he started two years before that earthquake came. But I'm telling you, there's going to be a trumpet. There's going to be a shout. There's going to be a church taken away. And this world is going to rock. This world is going to shake. Judgment's going to come. And you're going to wish that Amos, if I could just hear Amos, if I could just hear Brother Smith, if I could just be in one more revival, just one more camp meeting, uh, just one more word uh, from the Lord, I'm telling you, right now, son, uh, right now, uh, today uh, is your day uh, to hear what God uh, has to say. Uh, don't put it off. Uh, don't fold your arms, roll your eyes, uh, and get comfortable uh, in that padded pew uh, and say it's only the first night. Uh, yeah, it may be be the first night uh, but it might be your last chance uh, it may be the first night uh, but it might be my God uh, somebody better step out uh, and run to the altar uh, and fall in love uh, with God all over again uh, and get a hold of his word uh, and say I'm going to hear it uh, I'm going to heed it uh, I'm going to love it uh, I'm going to live it uh, I've got to have his word He that hath an ear, let him hear. Holy Ghost, help us just a little more. Oh, been a long time since this preacher feeling like he's feeling right now. This is old time conviction, boys. This is what your mom and grandpa and grandma used to talk about right here. Oh, God. When the Holy Ghost started revealing things, Brother Clyde, in a service like this and start pulling folks out, I'm telling you, you better move in God's direction while you got time. Somebody, somebody's trying to wake you up. Somebody's trying to get you to move. Oh, yeah. oh, it's, 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 it's time to wake up. It's the word of the Lord. It's not, the alarm's going off. It's trying to get you awake. Trying to pull you. But you know what? There's also something that Isaiah wrote about in 29. It's a spirit of slumber that God sent. And there wasn't nobody that could wake him up. Oh, you better wake up while you can. I said, you better hear the word while you can. While the alarm's being sounded. You better hear somebody. Better get out of that pew and come to this altar. Who, who is it? Uh, where are you at? Uh, why aren't you moving? Uh, oh, come on, church. Let's raise our hands and beg God for mercy. Let's beg God uh, to allow this spirit of conviction uh, to linger among us. Uh, what about a young man? Uh, what about a young man? Uh, what about it? Are you going to hear the word of the Lord? Uh, you're just going to brush it off. Uh, he was going to say, oh, he's just a herdman. That's all Amos is. Uh, he, he ain't got no pedigree. He ain't got no lineage. Ain't nobody. Uh, he ain't got a dad in the ministry. Uh, he's just from Tekoa. Who's he think he is coming to Bethel? Uh, I'll tell you who he was. Uh, he was a man sent from God uh, that had a warning and a word uh, and is running out of time. Uh, I'm going to tell you 
the sands uh, in the hourglass uh, they're swiftly passing uh, great God of heaven uh, you better hear uh, I said you better hear uh, while you can Oh God. Oh God. You better hear him while you can. There'll be a day you'd like to hear from him, and the heavens will be silent. There'll be a day you'll want to hear a word, and the heavens will be brass. (laughs) 